welcome seekers of hidden knowledge to the mystical realm of the occult. Delve into the secrets of the universe as we journey together into the enigmatic world of ancient wisdom. Brought to you by your guide through the shadows of enlightenment, wisdom rocker. Uncover the mysteries, unlock the power, and journey with us as we explore the hidden depths within the pages of forgotten scrolls and ancient texts. Prepare to embark on a journey beyond the ordinary, where wisdom transcends time and knowledge is your greatest ally. Welcome to Wisdom Rocker. Prepare to awaken your inner sage. In this video, we will be uncovering the wisdom within the chapters of Lectures on Ancient Philosophy Written by Manly P. Hall Chapter 8 The Mission of Aesthetics Aesthetics is that branch of philosophy concerned primarily with the intrinsic nature of beauty, its place in the divine plan and the processes whereby beauty can be created or caused to manifest where previously it did not exist in a tangible state. That beauty produces a profound effect upon the entire nature of man is too well established to be questioned. Just what constitutes beauty, however and why it wields so profound an influence is still a subject of controversy. Is environment the basis of an aesthetic standard, that is, does the familiar become the standard of aesthetic propriety? In a limited sense this must be true. On the other hand, man has been surrounded for ages with such familiar themes as war, disease and decay, yet he has never come to regard these as beautiful, at least not in his lucid moments. Beauty, declared the ancients, results from the harmonious correlation of parts, the spectacle of the mutual agreement of all the elements involved in a common pattern creates a pleasant reaction in the sensory organism of man. That the urge toward what man terms the beautiful is universally present in nature was also asserted. Certain natural processes were cited in support of this belief. For example, vines and creepers rapidly grow up to hide the gaunt outlines of a rotted tree and flowers in profusion blanket the shell-torn fields of Flanders once made horrible by the unleashed fury of man. Standards of beauty vary with the evolutionary status of races and individuals. The preference displayed by the nobility of Hawaii for stoutness of figure proved rather embarrassing to the court of Queen Victoria. The hennad whiskers of the Rajput gentry, while very chic in Rajputana, are a striking incongruity to Western standards of aesthetics. The quaint African custom of distending the lips and ears by the insertion of loops of bone or pliable wood is productive of a type of beauty totally beyond our Occidental comprehension. Furthermore, though our poets wax eloquent over the graceful lines of a swan's neck, Die Burmese bells, who achieve the literal effect by stretching their necks with iron rings, find our modern verse mongers strangely unresponsive to their charms. It is difficult, perhaps impossible, for the individual to view life with any aesthetic standard other than his own. If it were possible to analyze the sensory organism that can see symmetry in the bound and distorted foot of a Chinese lady, one great mystery of aesthetics would be well nigh solved. The gradual evolution of man's concept of beauty seemingly depends upon both the power of observation and the sense of proportion. For example, the child recapitulates, in some measure at least, the racial evolution of which it is a product. Children, while fond of drawing, are generally incapable of recognizing perspective and among primitive types nearly all art is two-dimensional. When a child designs a crude little house the size of a postage stamp and draws a man beside it several inches high, it senses no inconsistency in the possibility of the man to enter the house. In a similar way the little girl regards her doll as alive and intelligent, although well aware that its head is made of porcelain and its body of sawdust. Great battles are fought with little tin soldiers on a nursery floor and both the little chinchilla bear and wooden horse are endowed by their juvenile owner with all the qualities of their living prototypes. The sculptor of the Stone Age, probably likewise unaware of the crudity in his technique, 
evidently viewed his art as a striking reproduction of the person or principle he sought to portray. When the medieval artist drew upon canvas faces which were as expressionless as eggs he endowed them, so he believed, with all the beauty and vividness of his model. The evolving standards of symmetry, however, have outgrown his ideal, making the products of his brush now valuable for their oddity rather than their merit. Thus, while we are able to estimate the inconsistencies of the past when contrasted with the apparent consistencies of the present, we are wholly unable to realize how inconsistent the present will appear in the light of future standards. Some may still recall the time when dame fashion decreed bustles and leg of mutton sleeves for milady and when gentlemen had the creases pressed out of their trousers lest they be suspected of buying ready-made clothes. While all admit the revolutionary changes of fashion, the mental process that justifies these changes and ridicules that which it previously justified is more difficult of analysis. The average individual believes that beauty in style is established by the caprice of the modiste and fashionable tailor, who find it lucrative to cater to the love of novelty innate in human nature. While this may be the superficial explanation for these cycles of change, the definite trend of the centuries is produced by certain psychological tendencies. In discussing such problems of aesthetics as simplicity and complexity, a modern writer has arrived at some remarkable deductions. Simplicity has long been accepted as the chief prerequisite of beauty. This is definitely opposed to the barbaric tendency toward adornment. It is reasonably certain, for instance, that clothing, except in the most frigid zones, is the outgrowth of the desire for ornamentation rather than the dictate of utility. The theory is also now advanced that complexity is used to conceal weakness and simplicity to reveal strength. The evolutionary trend of aesthetics is obviously toward simplicity, for complexity invariably creates the sense of discord by scattering the faculties of comprehension. Man originally conceived ornamentation as complementing his personal dignity, he considered adornment a setting wherein he might be shown to better advantage. Illustrative of the degree to which this element has eclipsed the personality is the story of two ladies watching a third go by wearing a very expensive ermine cloak. Turning to the second lady, the first remarked, Did you see that magnificent cape that just passed by? Thus, in the effort to be beautiful, humanity has become a race of mannequins, hopelessly enslaved to fads and styles which, if not actually detrimental, are at least unnecessary. Greek supremacy in aesthetics is based upon the fact that they achieved the objectification of the beautiful while at the same time preserving utter simplicity. Never did they permit principles and ideals to become involved in complicated forms of manifestation so that they were even partly obscured. In Greek art the idea was ever apparent and with the objectification of that ideal labor forthwith ceased, for beauty was recognized to be a principle so elusive that it invariably escaped if the means to capture it were unduly stressed. Apropos of this truth is the saying that it requires two men to paint a great picture, the first is the artist, the second, a near friend whose duty it is to shoot the artist at the psychological moment. The plea of Greenwich Village, art for art's sake while it expresses a theoretical ideal, is often misapplied. There is a tendency to produce technicians who become so skilled in the manipulation of various mediums that they overlook the fact that all mediums are useful simply for the expression of an idea. The great artist is not necessarily a great technician, he is rather a man with a great idea. It is a curious, but nevertheless noteworthy fact that those with the best knowledge of grammar and composition seldom write the best books. Those who become slaves to means or methods are prone to lose sight of ends. Words are sound mosaics which by their combinations create pictures in the mind of the one who hears them. It is the ability of the speaker to create this picture in the mind of his audience that is of prime importance. His greatness is measured by the sublimity of that picture. What words are to the orator, pigments are to the artist. 
Through their infinite combinations eternal and intangible verities are expressed in a language comprehensible to the understanding soul. All the arts and sciences are such mediums of expression, fulfilling their purpose when they are developed not for their own sake but for the sake of those inner convictions which through them alone can be shadowed forth to become an impulse or urge in the external life. It is his own short-sightedness which invariably thwarts the ends of the technician, a certain thrill which accompanies the possession of an intricate and adequate mechanism of expression has a tendency to fascinate the mind and hold it as in a hypnotic spell. The fact that words, like colors, are susceptible of such a variety of combinations often intrigues the mind from pursuit of an ideal to lose itself in the maze of approaches to that ideal. The desirable knowledge of method is thus, acquired, but the chief purpose has been frustrated, namely, arrival at the true goal. The result is a wasted life in the sense that self-expression has failed to be objectified. To the ancients, the arts and sciences were all sacred to the gods and upon being admitted to apprenticeship the future craftsman dedicated whatever proficiency he might later acquire therein to the service or expression of eternal truths. Man studied that he might not only learn but that he might use intelligently. And what may be termed intelligent use? The answer is, a use that is beautiful, virtuous and necessary since these are the true characteristics of divinity, for God was regarded as the most beautiful, the most virtuous and the most necessary of all things. In its truest sense, therefore, aesthetics may be considered a philosophic discipline by which the consciousness of man is equipped to estimate the degree of beauty, the degree of virtue and the degree of utility inherent in the nature of an object, also, the power to discern how these qualities may be increased to ultimate perfection. The first work is to establish the nature of beauty, virtue, and utility in their most comprehensible sense. Before beauty is cognizable in other than its transitory and inconsequential sense, the consciousness must be elevated to that level of rationality on which the principle of beauty exists, dissociated from the clumsy efforts of man to express its qualities. Upon the basis that only the beautiful is capable of recognizing the beautiful, the assumption of the philosophic life is regarded as indispensable to the recognition of the aesthetics of divinity. Socrates would have conceived beauty as expressing itself in the social fabric as utility and in the moral fabric as virtue. To be beautiful is the natural state of all that is good, in that good must manifest good, and beauty most adequately expresses and is the inevitable attribute of the good. One of the primary axioms of geometry, that things which are equal to the same thing are equal to each other, may be profitably applied to this Socratic triad. So, in answer to the question, what is the most beautiful of all things? Philosophy says that which is the most virtuous and the most necessary. What is the most virtuous of all things? That which is the most beautiful and the most necessary. What is the most necessary of all things? That which is the most beautiful and the most virtuous. The truth of these assumptions is self-evident. Never has the world realized more clearly the utilitarian value of beauty or how necessary virtue is to the survival of the whole. Much of the crassness with which modern civilization is cursed has resulted from the divorce of beauty and utility, in which the spirit of aesthetics has been sacrificed to what we foolishly term the practical. Some years ago I visited a state prison and upon being taken into that section reserved for those commonly called lifers I was struck with the pathetic effort of the convicts to preserve the spirit of beauty behind the drab stone walls of their penal institution. The men had built little wooden flower boxes, fastening them to the foot of the grating of their cell doors. In these boxes were planted creeping vines which, growing upward, entwined themselves about the gratings and made of the iron bars a trellis. Also in the tenement districts of large cities where thousands are huddled together in an atmosphere of squalor and vice, the little potted geranium on the fire escape is a familiar spectacle, 
bearing witness to that spark of aesthetics which the Lord of the whole hid deep within each human heart. Although to a certain degree an intangible asset, beauty is the molding factor in racial and national life. As long as the spirit of the beautiful shines forth through the bodily structure of peoples and institutions, these increase in power and glory, but when aesthetics dies, the very structure of society deteriorates and begins its march toward inevitable oblivion. Beauty is a soul quality and like the soul is visible only in its tincturing effect upon its immediate environment. When life is actuated by the spirit of the beautiful, the entire organism social as well as individual, carrot is the beneficiary of a definite grace and charm which render a relatively imperfect body not only endurable but even attractive. It is not given that all human beings should have beauty or symmetry of form and features. As we pass through the Hall of Fame where the likenesses of the world's illustrious are preserved for the admiration of posterity, if mere physical symmetry be regarded as the sole criterion of excellence many of these geniuses were but rude caricatures of men and women. Carved deeply in the marble of immortality we find the crude and distorted face of Socrates, a little farther down the gaunt figure and aquiline features of Dante, while from his niche stares great Milton whose sightless eyes could yet envision paradise. More recent additions to the immortals are the lank and raw-boned Lincoln and the crippled Steinmetz. Why have the beautiful so often mounted to power through tyranny and oppression, while the deformed have nobly and unselfishly served mankind? The answer seems evident. Beauty has regarded its own existence as a substitute for merit and fascinated by its reflection in the mirror of vanity has therefore, passed into oblivion. On the other hand, those earth unsightly mean have struggled for that transcendent internal beauty which has elevated them to chief place in the hearts of men. That man has a compound nature is difficult for most people to understand. In other words, man is not merely an individual, he is many individuals considered as one. With similar propriety we might refer to an army as a single entity, disregarding the fact that an army is really an aggregation of entities. The brain of man is actually composed of over forty lesser brains, each a specialized organ of thought. Each of these complete thinking organisms vies with every other to dominate the entire organism of thought and through this competition of parts the compound mental attitude is established. Unaware of what may be termed the ethical code in the relationship of these brain parts to each other, man believes himself to be the master of his thinking processes, when in reality he is frequently the victim of their machinations. Throughout the entire constitution of man there is a continual plotting for precedence. To a certain degree each part victimizes its associates, with the result that the organism is a seething maelstrom of biological intrigue. In similar fashion the social order, which is really a vast body may be likened to the fabulous dragon whose seven heads are continually biting at each other. While the interdependence of parts prevents an open outbreak, there are few bodies in which even a comparative degree of harmony can be said to exist. The compound human organism may be fair to gaze upon but this does not necessarily prove that the various strata of its microcosmic social system are on amicable terms with each other. The human body is one of many examples of the failure of the democratic theory, for nothing could be more tragic than the picture of man's hands or feet liberated to work out their own destiny irrespective of the welfare of the rest. Only because there is within each of us an autocrat who binds the various members to the accomplishment of its own ends can even a semblance of order be maintained. When it is further realized that this autocrat is itself capable of error, in fact, almost incapable of anything else, we may better grasp the problem presented by the government of man's functions. The wonder is not that man manages his affairs so poorly, but that he manages them at all. An individual whose own internal parts are so badly disorganized as to make rational functioning impossible cannot but reflect his own indecisions into the social order of his civilization. 
the codes by which he lives, being the product of his own internal disquietude, thus, engender national and international friction with their resultant crime, war and disease. Like individual power, racial power must result from the autocratic usurpation of authority by some figure, no matter how despotic and arbitrary, who grasps the reins with a strong hand and drives the whole toward the consummation of its own desires. Men like Alexander the Great, Caesar, Genghis Khan and Napoleon, represent the personification of a racial urge which Nietzsche might call the will to power. These men gathered up the belligerent elements which had previously expended themselves in a guerrilla-like warfare of factions and directed them toward the goal of world conquest. While this procedure proved most distressing to the strangers without the gates who were its luckless victims, it alone preserved the political integrity of the exploiting powers. The moment either an individual or a nation ceases to struggle against external obstacles, internal dissensions arise. As soon as the Christian church stopped fighting the pagans, it began fighting itself. As rapidly as nations reach the point where they are strong enough to maintain an isolated individualism, they are destroyed by civil war. It is sad, but nevertheless true. That up to the present time conquest has been the only force strong enough to surmount national prejudices and cement them into national alliances. There is undoubtedly a certain relationship between this fact and the well-known adage that the devil finds mischief for idle hands to do. As the individual is likewise a nation in miniature, he is only capable of maintaining the efficiency of his separate organisms while these organisms as a whole are directed toward the achievement of a definite end. Though the lodestar of both nations and individuals, ambition has also proved to be their undoing, for, having outdistanced their resources, they were unable to maintain the positions they had gained. An ancient philosopher once said, If you want to humble your adversary, give him power. Power may be defined as the privilege of self-expression. Only the wise, however, can express themselves and still be great, the remainder reveal their own ignorance and thereupon tumble from their gilded thrones. To the question, what is the most powerful thing in all the world? The financier would answer, money, the general, guns and men, the religionist, the church, the scientist, knowledge the philosopher, reason, the mystic, love, the aesthetician, beauty. Money, while not inherently evil, has been the motivating principle behind nearly every form of crime known to man. Guns and men, as we know all too well, have become the elements of a gigantic destructive science which may hurl millions of living things to a horrible death in order to establish a diplomatic technicality. The Church, founded originally for the worship of God and the service of man, has now become an arrogant institution, looking with contempt upon those who supply it with the wherewithal of its very existence. Knowledge has deteriorated until it is simply a dust-covered stack of dry and worthless notions. Reason has degenerated into debate, wherein minds which should be directionalizing their efforts toward the good of the whole, huddle together under the cloak of learning and mumble their absurdities. Love, the most sacred of all emotions, has been dragged from its lofty pedestal and crimson-robed lust seated in its stead. As for beauty, it has sunk to depth so low as to be considered the vicarious atonement for irrationality. That beauty is a power is undeniable, but the magnitude of that power is as yet unsuspected. As the proper directionalization of beauty is a potent factor in the civilizing of races, so the misuse of this agency results in a corresponding degree of depravity. External beauty combined with the insolence of internal pride produced a Lucrezia Borgia who, with a face as beautiful as that of a saint, poisoned without a qualm of conscience all who stood in her way. Yet it is written of Lucrezia Borgia that despite her surpassing beauty there was an intangible something about her which filled everyone in her presence with indescribable fear and loathing. Thus, the internal nature is impossible of total concealment and where the outer beauty does not complement the grace within the soul, 
an incongruity surrounds the personality like an intangible miasma. The warring segments of a personality, as has been suggested, can only be unified by a common purpose which will enlist the sympathetic cooperation of all. Right motive, one of the eight noble paths of Buddhism can be made to unite all the diversified faculties and members of the nature and directionalize them toward achievement of the greatest good. The consciousness that steadfastly contemplates only good through all its diversified perceptions may be said to have united its various parts into a pattern worthy to be designated beautiful. Cooperation only can be conceived of as beautiful, for competition must ever manifest as a grotesque absurdity. Only a propaganda-ridden world could possibly imagine war to be beautiful and competition is merely a bloodless war in which the soul and not the body is slain. While contemplating the nature of the supreme good, the Neoplatonists of Alexandria also philosophized with rare lucidity upon the nature of the beautiful. Plotinus writes concerning the order of the beautiful as it emerges from the first beauty, and in the first rank we must place the beautiful and consider it as the same with the good, from which immediately emanate intellects as beautiful. Next to this we must consider the soul receiving its beauty from intellect, and every inferior beauty deriving its origin from the forming power of the soul, whether conversant in fair actions and offices, or sciences and arts. Lastly, bodies themselves participate of beauty from the soul, which, as something divine and a portion of the beautiful itself, renders whatever it supervenes and subdues, beautiful, as far as its natural capacity will admit. Beauty, existing independent of form and as a divine principle, is likened to the fountainhead of existence, from which streams of beauty flow forth to permeate and beautify the whole inferior creation. Furthermore, the beauty of the inner nature greatly transcends the beauty of the outer, for the spiritual essences constituting the supersubstantial man, being more proximate to cause, partake more fully of the nature of cause, which is true beauty. Hence, as Plotinus also observes, there are those who on perceiving the forms of gods or demons, no longer esteem the fairest of corporeal forms. The quest of the truly beautiful is therefore, identical with the quest of self, for self in its perfect and universalized sense, the all-pervading consciousness postulated by the sage is the perfect source of all beauty and therefore, partakes in perfect measure of all that which is manifested from itself. That this supreme truth was taught by the sacred institutions of antiquity is further evidenced by Plotinus, who continues, just as those who penetrate into the holy retreats of sacred mysteries are first purified and then divest themselves of their garments, until someone, by such a process, having dismissed everything foreign from the God, by himself alone, beholds the solitary principle of the universe, sincere, simple and pure, from which all things depend and to whose transcendent perfections the eyes of all intelligent natures are directed, as the proper causes of being, life and intelligence. M. The Neoplatonists did not confine themselves solely to a theoretical consideration of mystical truths, they deemed it also essential that the disciple learn to actually partake of the verities disclosed by intellectual contemplation. If perfect beauty was synonymous with perfect good, then the achievement of perfect participation in its effulgence was of first importance. As the ephemeral beauties of the outer, or material, world were sensed chiefly through the eyes, so the eternal beauties of the inner, or spiritual, world could only be sensed through a mystical perception which they termed the eye of the soul. We must enter deep into ourselves again says Plotinus, and leaving behind the objects of corporeal sight, no longer look back after any of the accustomed spectacles of sense. For it is necessary that whoever beholds this beauty should withdraw his view from the fairest corporeal forms and convinced that these are nothing more than images, vestiges, and shadows of beauty, should eagerly soar to the fair original from which they are derived. For he who rushes to these lower beauties, as if grasping realities where they are only like beautiful images appearing in water, will doubtless, like him in the fable, 
by stretching after the shadow, sink into the lake and disappear. For by thus, embracing and adhering to corporeal forms he is precipitated, not so much in his body as in his soul, into profound and horrid darkness, and thus, blind, like those in the infernal regions, converses only with phantoms, deprived of the perception of what is real and true. While the Alexandrian mystics shared the Oriental attitude concerning the attainment of reality through rejection of the illusions of sense, they had more definite conclusions as to the method whereby the causal beauty was to be realized. Their instructions read thus, Recall your thoughts inward and if, while contemplating yourself, you do not perceive yourself beautiful, imitate the sculptor, who, when he desires a beautiful statue cuts away what is superfluous, smooths and polishes what is rough and never desists until he has given it all the beauty his art is able to effect. In this manner must you proceed, by lopping what is luxuriant, directing what is oblique and by purgation illustrating what is obscure, and so continue to polish and beautify your statue until the divine splendor of virtue shines upon you in temperance, seated in pure and holy majesty, rises to your view. To the ancients aesthetics was not only the science of beauty, but that discipline whereby each individual in his quest for truth might elevate his own level of functioning so as to become luminous with the reflected light of universal beauty and ultimately identical therewith. Two forms of beauty were postulated, that which is intrinsic to the nature of a body and that which is extrinsic or communicated from some external source. In man, for example, beauty was the natural attribute of the spiritual nature, but the material nature partook thereof only by reflection. Being a rational creature manifesting through an irrational animal organism, man has the capacity to recognize and estimate the excellence of order, symmetry, and grace. Even as that which is base finds response in the baseness of the material nature, so that which is beautiful a, wakens a pleasant reaction in the rational part. As Bacchus was dismembered by the Titans and his parts strewn throughout the irrational sphere, so the rational soul of man is scattered throughout the substances of his irrational animal nature. To the presence of this element of confusion is referable the inability to recognize or appreciate such soul qualities as harmony and beauty. The pleasurable sensation which beauty awakens in the beholder was said by the Greeks to arise from an internal symmetrical nature beholding an external body with qualities similar to its own. As the internal nature dwells in perfect order, it thus, rejoices in order and recoils from disorder. To a certain degree beauty is order and as such is compatible with that internal orderliness which inevitably follows the liberation of rationality from the disorganizing effect of matter. Beauty rejoices in its own nature and even the faintest shadow of it awakens a glad response. The infinite diversity of standards by which beauty is measured result from the various combinations of rationality and irrationality present in the soul. That which is beautiful to one is not necessarily beautiful to another and yet beauty as a principle is common to all. We consider that to be beautiful which approaches most closely the symmetry of our own internal natures, and as the inner nature evolves more perfect harmonies we become more discriminating in our responsiveness to external stimuli. Gradually symmetry of form gives place to symmetry of thought and the beauties of the inner nature are then revealed as surpassing the beauties of the outer form. The Neoplatonic theory of beauty may be summed up as the rationality of the beholder rejoicing in the evidence of rationality in the thing beheld. Grace, symmetry, harmony and order are unquestionable evidence of a rational consciousness and we rejoice in this evidence to the same degree that we possess the ability to recognize them. That is most beautiful, therefore, which elicits most perfect response from our inner perceptions. Through philosophy we ascend from that beauty communicated from an external source to the recognition of that beauty identical with source itself. Having ultimately attained through right thinking, right feeling and right living to the condition of the beautiful within ourselves, 
with enraptured vision we can respond in perfect measure to the eternal beauty which flows from the inexhaustible fountain of the one good. In the present century two great opposing systems of thought are struggling for supremacy. On the one hand is idealism, which declares that to be practical which is beautiful, on the other hand is realism, which asserts that to be beautiful which is practical. It is difficult to estimate the profound effect caused by this simple interchange of the words practical and beautiful. Practicality must be interpreted to imply the greatest good to the greatest number and there is no question that, if so interpreted, that which is of the greatest good to the greatest number is the beautiful necessity. However, we may well ask if what we now term practical is actually fulfilling this ideal. Much of the structure of modern civilization is revolting to the finer sentiments of humanity. Albert Hubbard can hardly be censured for defining civilization as a device for increasing human ills, a machine for the perpetuation of the weak, an ingenious contraption for spreading disease and hunger. Men and women of vision all realize that modern civilization is doomed to collapse under the weight of its own infirmities. Like the mighty juggernaut, it is rumbling down the hillside of time to vanish ultimately in the veil of oblivion below. The reason civilization must crumble is because it is not beautiful, and lacking the order, harmony, symmetry and grace which collectively constitute beauty, it will be disintegrated by the friction of its own individual parts. Like the scaled, fire-belching dragon of mythology, it is the jealous guardian of the tree upon whose branches hangs the golden fleece. Even today the Argonaut sets forth. Man in his quest for happiness which alone makes life endurable, is determined, like Jason, to wrest the highest prize from the clutches of the monster he himself has created. The future dragon, Slayer is first born in the human soul as the spirit of revolt against the crushing weight of the artificial world which man in his folly has raised, Babel-like, to rival the glory of the heavens. Man has built a house whose bricks are made of mud and held together by slime. Indifferent to the laws of social architecture, he has raised this mighty edifice upon shifting sand and now its walls of their own weight threaten to collapse about the heads of the foolish builders. Seated on their golden thrones the titans of finance gaze down, like the huge stone Memnons of Egypt, upon a devastated land. Like the pharaohs of the ancient Nile their sandals are pounded from the golden crowns of vanquished kings. Wall Street may be likened to that gloomy ravine which led down to the depths of Dante's Inferno. Here souls lost in the maze of their own greeds and passions wander in the dim light that finds its way down between the towering skyscrapers that rise cliff-like on either hand. Wall Street is a most appropriate symbol of the path of glory which General Wolfe declared leads but to the grave, for at one end of that short but awful thoroughfare lay the murky and polluted waters of the river, at the other stand the crumbling and moss-covered headstones of Trinity's churchyard. There is a common saying upon the street that those who succeed are laid away in pomp to the chime of old Trinity's bells, while those who fail are found floating upon the turbid breast of the river. As one gazes downward upon the teeming world maelstrom of human endeavor where millions of creatures in ant-like confusion struggle to survive, with no time, no strength, no opportunity to dream, to hope or to aspire, he can better sense the incubus of civilization. To what end all this cyclopean struggle in which destruction is ever the victor? As one regards this seething cauldron where, like the witches of Macbeth, the three sisters, ignorance, superstition and fear, brew their poisonous broths, he cannot but recall the prophetic words of Prospero in the tempest, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself. Yeah, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded leave and not a rack behind, we are such stuff as dream are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. 
When the Bishop of Ripon suggested to the British Association for the Advancement of Science that it take a ten-year vacation for the good of the human soul, this venerable churchman precipitated a storm of protest. The very greatness of his, man's, recent achievements declared the bishop, would seem to make his ruin more certain and more complete. While any cessation of man's effort to improve his own status would undoubtedly prove disastrous, there is no doubt that the bishop has sensed an impending catastrophe that ever-widening gap between the spiritual and the material life of man. Man's internal progress has failed to keep abreast with the growth of his conveniences. With the advent of the washing machine it cannot be said that we have registered corresponding improvement in our standards of beauty, ethics, and aesthetics. The popular superstition that if the body is comfortable the spirit will take care of itself has not been justified by experience. Although too many churchmen wander in a maze of theological complexities, still for the most part they recognize the need of spiritual education. If his inner nature fails, man perishes, and while in the last analysis failure can only be temporary, still to disregard the sciences of the higher life is but to prolong the agonies of the unillumined state. The enlightened theologian does not desire to tear down the achievements of science or belittle the blessings that it has conferred upon mankind. The true spiritual thinker merely affirms the necessity of elevating the sciences of the soul to a parity with those of the body. He regrets that man should learn to live so well only to ultimately die as badly as before. Whereas, according to the theologian, man may live in this world but a few score years, he is predestined to endure in a transcendental state throughout all eternity. If he is willing to spend so great a part of his life equipping himself for the little span of earth life, should he not, argues the bishop, also give some consideration to that greater life of which the present is but the vestibule? A just criticism against modern science is that as it magnifies by its repeated emphasis the importance of terrestrial concerns, it belittles in like measure the still nobler concerns of the spirit. Savants are too prone to solve the problem of the after-death state by disdainfully rejecting the concepts of immortality as but another survival of primitive superstition. Thus, the day of greatest physical light bids fair to become the day of greatest spiritual darkness. It is questionable if science will ever be able to make the earth such a desirable locale that world-worn souls will not ultimately be glad to escape from its stifling environment. The goal of science apparently is perpetuation of the physical life, which seemingly is the only life of which it is sure. Since woman is devoting more of her time to consideration of world problems she may be gratified to learn that one scientist assures us that within the next century babies will be manufactured in the laboratory to meet any and all specifications. Physical immortality, therefore, may be regarded as the ultimate goal of science, which can conceive of no other form of immortality. Thus, the modern scientist actually seeks that same elixir of life which he ridicules the medieval alchemist for declaring to be a reality. The Church very properly opposes this so-called practical attitude, since if physical immortality be the real goal of existence the universe is without integrity, for how can the dead past share in the immortality of the unborn future? The mystic also realizes the insufficiency of this new physical urge which worships a word and pays homage to its own achievements as summed up in the term practical. To him the word is a synonym for the prosaic in whose presence the finer qualities of life must inevitably languish and die. No sane man would block the progress of human thought or condemn any real contribution to the life, happiness, or efficiency of the race. Men and women with vision would, however, rejoice if they could see growing up in the world an institution both vast and beautiful which would serve the aesthetic needs of the individual and would ensure that life would be not only efficient but also beautiful, that man would enjoy not only health of body but be possessed of healthy emotions and ideals. The population of earth is sufficient to assure science that it will never be without a body of informed men and women to carry forward its ideals.
There are enough also to form another group as strong, as noble and as true to preserve those aesthetic principles which existed long before the dawn of modern thought and without which science as an institution could never have existed. When by some joyous exception of nature we find the scientist in whom the beautiful is an awakened and radiant force, there results a type of mind as constructive as any modern society can produce. It will yet be demonstrated that no scientist can achieve to the highest in his chosen field until he acknowledges the existence of a superphysical nature which survives the dissolution of its temporal parts. Even as men in primitive times fashioned crude images and then bowed humbly before their own creations, so the scientist of today has but elevated his superstitions to a more dignified level, for having fashioned with his own reason the entire body of science, he now contemplates with an awe approaching blind adoration the craftsmanship he has wrought. Without doubt the prosaic attitudes of scientific men have done much to turn thinking minds from the contemplation of aesthetics to the more utilitarian themes of biology and physics. Science has the unquestioned advantage of tangible evidence of its utilitarian value. We are ever surrounded by the examples of scientific accomplishment, while the accomplishments of aesthetics, being largely limited to the internal nature, make no showing impressive to the uncultured. With its emphasis solely upon the practical, the realistic interpretation of life over justifies existing conditions, for it assumes that because deformity exists it must be necessary in being necessary, it must be beautiful. Dr. Will Durant has defined the true offices of realism and idealism. Existing conditions, he declared, should be analyzed in the terms of realism and reconstructed in the terms of idealism. There is an element of precocity among civilized peoples today which is most unseemly, sophistication is everywhere. The surfeit of advantages which we have enjoyed has brought in its train the state of boredom. Nothing pleases, nothing suffices, nothing intrigues. The race has an inclination to sit around and await dissolution as the one remaining experience that may contain the element of novelty. College youths finds it necessary to murder in order to create a passing thrill. Externally we are simply over-civilized, internally we are morons. The very people who suffer most keenly for this chronic ennui, who are satiated with the entire subject of life have never really experienced in their thoughts, feelings or actions any of the more profound verities of existence. Turning from the sordidness of realism, let us look at the world through the eyes of those dreamers who have dared to believe that the good in human nature would ultimately blossom forth and regenerate the entire social system. Beauty, declared the ancient philosophers, was the only offering acceptable to the gods. Furthermore, Beauty being the environment of divinity, God himself was present in every manifestation of the beautiful. In the scriptures it is written that if the temple is built according to the law, the living God will dwell therein. The Greek Dionysiacs symbolized the establishment of world harmony by the erection of a temple to the universal creator. Upon the theory that like attracts like they philosophized that when the world was made beautiful, souls of the nature of beauty would incarnate to people it. Because of their belief in reincarnation, the Greeks taught that rational souls incarnated in harmonious environments, whereas discordant areas were populated with irrational creatures whose own internal discord attracted them to a discordant sphere. The remarkable physical symmetry for which the Greeks are justly famed is ascribed to a peculiar practice. Prospective mothers were isolated from the confusion of the community life and spent their days in secluded gardens filled with statuary representative of the ideals of grace and beauty. They were not permitted to look upon any asymmetrical object lest it mark the coming child. In some communities they went so far as to destroy at birth the crippled or unsightly. This was done not only to prevent the suffering resultant from such affliction but also that society might not through the sight of such malformations perpetuate that which was not beautiful. Much of our crime and degeneracy can be traced to home environment. 
Mystical philosophy declares heredity in its conventional sense to be a fallacious doctrine. We do not actually inherit the traits of our ancestors, rather, these traits are environments which call into incarnation souls of a like degree of rational development. A home in which dissension reigns attracts to itself a soul equally discordant. When upon reaching maturity such a soul exhibits the traits of its parents, such traits are erroneously ascribed to the previous generation by such as do not realize that each evolving consciousness has its own definite temperament and does not receive its temperamental bias from another. The Collective Attitudes of Nations Generations and races result in their drawing into objective manifestation all subjective qualities consistent with their own. When a nation gives itself over chiefly to problems of finance, souls who conceive money to be of primary importance incarnate therein until ultimately the entire fabric of that people is permeated with this common attitude. Souls in whom corresponding interests do not exist apart from such people and either appear in other races or else in anticipation of a better day resign themselves to patience. If we truly wish to beautify our present civilization we must realize the necessity of creating an environment which will draw into objective manifestation the nobler souls whose rational faculties have been unfolded to a comprehension of the harmonious and the good. This same environment will further stimulate to rationality those who have not yet fully achieved to this exalted state. Philosophy was the dominating passion of ancient Greece and so intense was its attractive power that it drew into incarnation the greatest number of noble thinkers the human race has ever produced. If we would endure as a great people, we too must realize that as qualities increase in excellence they also increase in permanence and that a civilization established upon virtue, beauty and utility will endure long after the structures erected upon the foundations of finance and war have vanished from the earth. Today the philosopher in search of reality must retire deep into the recesses of his inner self and thus, escape from the discordances of the outer life. If he would think, he must depart from the mob which in its non-productive scrambling scatters the faculties of the mind and robs man of his most precious gift, the power of thought. It should not be necessary for man to leave the world in order to find himself, for his world should be a place where his true nature may mingle in concord with the true natures of all other beings. The sham of civilization is apparent when we realize that it forces the majority of people to assume false lives, to live in conflict with their inner convictions. The idealist must keep silent or be reviled. The thinker must hold his peace or be persecuted, the mystic dares not share his vision with the world which, though aware that he is right, will crucify him if not in body at least in soul. Hence, those with little knowledge babble continuously and their words become the laws of men, while those of nobler vision must remain unknown, unhonored, and unsung. Never can we rise to the true height seen by the eyes of the idealist while we are in servitude to the inferior part of ourselves. Man does not realize the weight of that curse by which he was cast forth from the light of truth to wander in the darkness of his own making. He feels helpless in the presence of the vast industrial mechanism which has required centuries for its perfection and which has now assumed an appearance so formidable that even those who consider themselves its masters tremble and are afraid. Philosophy knows that before man can really live, the machine must go, and if humanity is incapable of self-emancipation it must wait until the mechanism grinds itself to pieces. It is predestined that the golden age shall come again that men shall live together in love and understanding and the earth shall become once more a garden of surpassing beauty as it was in the beginning. In that time men shall learn all that they learn now. There shall be great institutions for research and record, the arts and crafts shall flourish. But unlike preceding generations this era shall not pass away for the god of it shall be beauty and where beauty in its various aspects rules a people that people shall remain as permanent as eternity. It is not necessary that we tear down the entire structure of our present system or revert to some savage type and start anew. 
It is merely necessary that we tincture utility with beauty, that we add the sole qualities of symmetry and grace to the products of our schemings. Beauty is the deadly enemy of every excess, for into its constitution enter the elements of grace, proportion, symmetry and harmony. A thousand means have been suggested by which the injustice of men may be offset, but all these must ultimately fail unless aesthetics becomes an integral part of our social fabric. Until the soul reaches that degree of rationality wherein it is able to recognize the supreme importance of the beautiful, it cannot withstand the urge of selfishness and greed which ever lure nations as well as individuals to their destruction. When we love the beautiful as we now love the dollar we shall have a great and enduring civilization. When we adore the God of harmony as we once worship the God of vengeance, we shall know the inner mystery of life. When we create with symmetry, preserve with integrity and release with joy, then only are we good. Never until we have become one with the good can we be happy, for happiness is the realization of internal beauty which joyously goes forth to mingle itself with the beauty that dwells in space. Thanks for watching the Wisdom Rocker. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.